All right, guys, today we're going to be taking a look at complicated portfolios, risk parity. Are you as diversified as you think you are? And what purpose does your diversification serve? And we're going to be creating this episode with the help of longtime community member, Frank Vasquez, who is also the host of Risk Parity Radio, probably the fastest growing niche financial podcast in the entire world. Highly recommend that you check it out. Welcome to the ultimate crowdsource personal finance show. This is Choose FI. All right, guys, really excited to dive into this episode. Again, we, as we mentioned, we're going to have Frank Vasquez from Risk Parity Radio on the show with us today. If you have not yet checked out episode 194, you can find it at choosefi.com slash 194. And in that episode, we talked about the role of bonds in a portfolio, kind of limiting ourselves to uh, that very kind of focused topic for the purposes of really exploring the parameters, what similar characteristics do all bonds have and what makes them different. And Frank really helped us explore things through the lens of, I believe, stability, inverse correlation, and oh, you're, you're really going there's there, one more you? I was, I, there's three, there's three reasons, <laughs> and we're going to get Frank to let us know what that third one is. With that, Frank Vasquez, welcome to the show, buddy. How you doing? Good, good. All right. And you want to help me out? What's the last one? Yeah, I got close. those three are income, stability, and diversification. diversification. And diversification is what you're thinking about with inverse correlation, because- those are the most diversified bonds from stocks. Yeah. And Frank, that reminds me of uh, a quote you have here on the homepage of riskparityradio.com from Ray Dalio, uh, author of Principles. And he said, the holy grail of investing is, quote, making a handful of good uncorrelated bets. It is the surest way of having a lot of upside without being exposed to unacceptable downside. And yeah, that just jumped off the page to me because I think that's what we're all looking for here. When you, when you try to diversify, I think a lot of us are looking for whether we know it or not, frankly, these uncorrelated bets, but are we really getting there? I think that's a question a lot of us have to ask ourselves. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's something I would personally love to dive into for yeah, sure. a significant portion of the conversation. I mean, that's that's what I call the Holy Grail principle. It's named after that. You can find Ray Dalio on YouTube talking about his Holy Grail principle. and uh, But is to really focus in on what does diversification mean. Diversification just doesn't mean different. It means uncorrelated, and the way you move that is with a number. And you can look up now on a site like Port Visualizer, take one of your funds and another fund and put them in there, and it will give you a number from negative one to one. A number that is close to one means the two assets are correlated or the highly correlated. So they do the same things essentially. Now, if you have two assets and their and their number is, is around zero or getting close to zero, that means they are uncorrelated in the sense that they just move randomly differently. If you get a negative number when you do that, that means they are negatively correlated and they go they typically go in the opposite directions from each other most of the time. How people like think this through, like why we would want that. For instance, I'll just give you the, 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 the example here that it's kind of a straw man, but I'm just, I think it's important for people just to think through the logic, follow this logic to its natural conclusion. I'm in stocks. My stocks are doing great. I have something that's uncorrelated and it's doing horrible. Why would I want any losers? Like, you know, that that's the one. And so someone that is potentially accumulating, they're trying to build wealth as quickly as possible. And they're like, why would I want something that's not correlated with something that I have that that's doing well? Like, help me play that out and talk about uncorrelation, how it might affect an individual's and uh, individual investors path to financial independence. Well, I think you said some magic words there, which you said is accumulating because you, you probably don't need these negatively correlated assets if you are your in your accumulation phase, because you are trying to build a large portfolio you're going to invest mostly in the best things that do that, which happen to be stock funds, at least as we commonly know. And you are willing to take on lots and lots of volatility because you don't plan on using that money soon. Where this matters is when you get to FI or you're getting close to it or you're just you've accumulated a big portfolio and you're just getting nervous about it. And so you want a portfolio that essentially 
has the highest safe withdrawal rate that you can have for that portfolio, particularly if you're drawing down on it. And that that number, I mean, we, we, we throw around the 4% rule, but that's based on one simple portfolio of stocks and treasury bonds from the 1990s. Every portfolio has a different safe withdrawal rate. And they're not all wildly different. It's not like you're going to have one that's 10% and one that's zero for but they're all clustered, say, between three and five and a half percent. Frank, and, how do you can can I just interrupt? How do you calculate that with any degree of certainty? Like how 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 would one know that? There are two good sites for where you can run these calculations. One is called Portfolio Charts, and you can put in a, a wide variety of portfolios, and it has it has fifty years of data, it goes back to nineteen seventy. And that gives you a pretty good idea of uh, at least comparing uh, various portfolios as to what that might be like. And what's what's nice about going back to that period is it covers an inflationary period, a couple of growth periods, a deflationary period. So we've seen, you know, all of those uh, all of those things happen. And I apologize, the phone is ringing in the background. I we found someone who still has a landline, folks. Yeah, You've been time. identified. <laughs> Love it. I finally got rid of mine about <laughs> two months ago. Um, so the other place to do this uh, easily is called Portfolio Visualizer. And that site has a much broader database in terms of you can put in lots of individual funds, whereas Portfolio Charts, you're just putting in like asset classes, like a total stock market or a small cap value fund or a international fund. In Portfolio Visualizer, it lets you put in specific funds, but you're only going to get an analysis for however long that fund has existed. Um, you can also put in asset classes and get some analyses that go 1980s, which are useful. We are, I think, in an era where we are able to do so much more uh, as individual investors than we were even five years ago. These These sites did not exist. And now we have a lot more data and tools that are available so we can think more about what different assets in a portfolio are going to be like. Because in the past, it was a lot of guessing and we had to just sort of rely on a few chestnuts, a few articles, a few, um, the information that that somebody with lots and lots of data, but, you know, um, it's some hedge fund or something had, you know, written a big paper on at some point going back to those uh, things in the 1990s. <laughs> Believe it or not, what the biggest tool that uh, Ray Dalio used to come up with all these things back in that time period was an Excel spreadsheet. Him and Brad <laughs> could get along great, you know, just sharing yeah. their Excel notes with each other. Yeah. Just, just <laughs> you and Ray, if man. you could imagine, come. Uh, and, and now the tools we have are, are, uh, are just much more uh, superior. Um, and, and we can do much more with them. Frank, if I were to solicit from an audience, someone's, you know, portfolio, their allocation of stocks to bonds, et cetera, could we at some point in the future, like literally go through the process of mapping out that portfolio, we'll record it, mapping out that portfolio on portfolio visualizer or portfolio charts. And then sure. the, the, the follow-up to that is I felt like you were saying that you could then draw conclusions from past data. Clearly this is all retrospective from past data, but based over 50 years of of good data. And then I guess more data that is less good, but there, uh, we could then draw a conclusion from that of what a, a good safe, a, a, a relatively reliable safe withdrawal rate would be based on that exact portfolio. So there is like something to be said for like, as we start to aggregate our portfolio, as we start to think about these conditions and we build these assumptions and, uh, something like what you just described, would it actually be able to help us come up with a safe withdrawal rate? Yeah, it, it, it comes up with an estimate. I mean, these are always going to be estimates. Um, but then they also have more calculators there. For instance, in at portfolio charts, you can find a retirement withdrawal calculator. And that allows you to put your portfolio in and do an analysis of how, how, how many times would that have failed in the past 50 years if you would have used it and you would have, say, taken a 4% withdrawal rate or a 5% withdrawal rate or withdrawal rate. Because one of the wonderful things about that particular calculator is 
it allows you to different have different rules for withdrawal. One of the things that is really lacking, I think, in the financial uh, the independence community is understanding what that 4% rule, rule was, and then how is that probably not what you're going to use, and how can you use a more like a variable withdrawal rate is what most people are going to be using, that they're not going to be taking the amount every year and then increasing it every year for the rest of their life. They're probably going to be taking out some more in good in good years and some less in bad years. And if you have that kind of flexibility, that also plays into the the survival of the portfolio, if you will. Gotcha. Frank, I want to ask a, uh, a two part question here. Um, I know you said a couple of minutes ago that this is really your strategies that we're talking about tonight are really for people as they're approaching FI retirement, whatever you want to call it. I know you have uh, a couple of sons, uh, three sons, I believe, under 30 or thereabouts, uh, you know, in the accumulation stage, I'd love to just hear like a super quick overview of, of what your kind of optimal advice would be for, for your own sons. And then, you know, the second more nuanced part would be as we get closer, I think a lot of people, we get closer to five, we get closer to retirement, whatever it may be. A lot of people don't know how to, how to manually change. So you go from, Hey, I've got 30 years worth of accumulation and built in gains and all this stuff. Like, how do I then get to one of these portfolios? So I know that's, you know, never good to ask a question with two parts, but I'm, I'm confident that you can have a pension for it. <laughs> I've heard that apology two many times. Questions. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome, Frank. And go. So, so let's talk about, let's talk about what I do with, uh, for, uh, how I advise my, my children. I have, uh, we have three sons. Uh, one is, 25. He's been out in the workforce for a couple of years. One is just graduated from college and uh, he got a job. Um, and so he's going to be um, on his way. And then we have another one in long. What I have advised him to do is, I mean, he didn't really want to pay them good in particular that, that, you know, max out your retirement accounts and, um, and put, put it all in, you know, basic index funds. Um, and so he's got, you know, the fidelity, they have fidelity at that where he works and he's got the, um, the, the total market or the S and P 500. I can't remember which one it is. And that's, that's where most of his money is, is being saved. Um, he's more recently became, became more interested in sort of the, the nuances or different, you know, thinking about other things, but let, but let me tell you more about, there are other things that he's doing that, that we, that we use. The, the stuff that I build out for. First of all, he's got um, an emergency fund um, and that's like the first bucket. That gets filled up. And, and so whenever something comes off the emergency fund, he's got more in there than he needs to. Then he moves it into a, a, a taxable brokerage account. And what he uses that for or has used it for was to put a down payment on a house and do house hacking because he read Scott Trench's book and went wild about it and decided that's what he wanted to do. And so he's uh, got three um, former roommates, now tenants. Um, and, wow. But the way he saved in that account is by using a risk parity style portfolio, because this kind of portfolio is also good for intermediate term savings. If you have a goal that's somewhere like between five and 10 years, you could say this with virtually any kind of retirement style portfolio would be good for that. But the kinds of portfolios I'm talking about have a only having a max 20% drawdown and max three year time period for the drawdown. So they fit in for that. Um, and I'm sorry about the dog now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> zebra run through. And <laughs> They fit, they fit into that, that intermediate time frame that you could use one of these kinds of portfolios for. And just, just one more comment on thinking about your accumulation phase for the younger folks. I, I think the way and, and what gets people nervous about putting that first money in and they say, just put it all in the stock market and go, go, go. And they're like, oh my God. But, but I think you want to pull back and think of it more holistically. When you start out, what you're actually sitting on is essentially a pile of future cash. You are planning on investing, I don't know, $300,000 over the next 20 years or some big number like that. 
if you think about that, that is all just in cash. And so what, and you only are allowed to invest a little bit of it each year. So it is incumbent on you to get that into the the risky, most growth oriented things that you can find that are reliable, which happen to be stock index funds. And so that is why it, it makes the most sense to really just focus on getting it in there. Uh, I think the other advice I commonly give to the beginning investors is you only need one fund until you have about a hundred thousand dollars in there uh, or your annual salary is kind of a guidepost. And the reason that is, is that it is really all about the earning and saving at the, at the beginning of this journey that the investing part, it, 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 you put $5,000 in there, you make 20% on it. That's, that's $1,000. When you have $100,000 in there, that's $20,000. And all of a sudden, your investing means more. Um, but that also gives you the time to go and read a few books and think about you know, what you ultimately want to do with your investments. In the meantime, just having that one fund is fine. You don't need to optimize um, you know, your first 401k or, or anything like that. Um, because we just want to get people going on that. I love that. I think that is I uh, that's a sorely missing piece in terms of the simplicity. Like people want to go sometimes want to go straight to complexity, and then they freak out when they see the complexity, and then they just don't do anything. And I, I do think in my own personal finance journey, I don't know if I had that framework in mind quite as much, but I do remember getting to a net worth over six figures, getting that first hundred k it kind of opened up a door to another phase where if you are ready to embrace a little bit more complexity, if you are ready to, you have a good foundation, you want to do more. Um, but I think for everybody, just getting that first hundred K is like, keep it simple. And it's going to be mostly driven on, on your savings rate. You know, you're gonna have to front load that work. But once you get to hundred K, like if you do make 8% returns, we're looking at $8,000 a year that your money is now earning for you going forward. We've now built a very significant, you know, income earning, um, entity that works 24 seven on our behalf. And maybe sometimes it makes more, sometimes it makes less, but you've truly moved to this point where your, your money is making substantial amounts of money for you. And, uh, for me, I, I do feel like that kicked in that realization kicked in right around hundred K and you realize this is real. There, there's a nice article written by Michael Kitsis that I, mean, I, I can give you guys and you can link to that is about the, essentially the four phases of investing. And the first two are earning and saving and the earning and saving are the most important things to begin with and getting that automated savings going. And then you stage three is investing and it doesn't become important in terms of managing that until there's more in there. Uh, and then, and then you get to the, the fourth stage is managing your investments. So they don't, you know, blow up or go away. The other thing that you can think about is you're, you're building a, um, you know, kind of an edifice of investments. You're always going to want to have a big portion of just a basic index fund, um, in there. And so there's no necessary need to putting more things in there until you get a, a good thing accumulated. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not discouraging anybody from doing those sorts of things, but I, 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 I'm more talking to people who are just trying to get going and wondering if they're doing the right thing by something and it's, it, should they be doing more? And the answer is, no, you don't need to. Um, that uh, you're getting 80% of the, of the value of investing just by doing that that one simple thing or those two simple things. Frank, just a, a quick follow-up to something you said about your son. So the interplay between his, you know, starting out and getting that base that you're talking about of the low-cost index funds, et cetera, with, you said he started implementing one of these risk parity portfolios for a, like a concrete goal, I guess, of... Yeah. of buying this house. What is that interplay? Like, how, how do you advise somebody who, I mean, it's, there's obviously finite money to save, right? And you're 22, 23, 24, whatever it may be. Like, how do you prioritize, I guess, the goal and using the risk parity portfolio with the long-term accumulation? I think, I mean, I told him, you know, the, the, the long-term accumulation sort of comes first. And I mean, he's a frugal guy. And so he's completely maxed out the 401k, the, the IRA. He's got something called a 401a that his employer puts more money into. Wow. And so, you know, he's got 
saving between twenty five and thirty thousand dollars just in that, um, and that's more than enough for for yeah. <laughs> his pieces are covered. Just uh, yeah, yeah, he's standard. got a he's got a very high savings rate, and yeah. and and now that he's house hacking, he's not paying any rent, and so all that's going into his risk parity portfolio, and he's just. He's doing what t- Scott Trench described in that book. It's just kind of that's amazing. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great book. It's a great book, man. So yeah, Frank, I, I guess you know, as as your son, let's just use your son as as the case study here, right? So you know, he gets back to accumulation. He's bought this this house hack, and he accumulates for whatever twenty years. He reaches phi, et cetera. You know, you said at the outset that a lot of your risk parity portfolios are really pertinent when when you're at that point of of FI or retirement or whatever it may be. But obviously there has to be some transition. I think this is what people struggle with on a granular level, myself included. And people ask me this all the time. <laughs> I don't have a great answer, right? Which is, hey, I've got this big pot of money sitting in low cost index funds. I theoretically might want to do something like Frank is advocating, but I just, I don't know how to get from here to there. Yeah. And there's taxes, there's all th- sorts of considerations. like. How do you how do you actually do that? I think, you know, before we get into the questions from the audience, like I feel like this is such a fundamental piece that is just so lacking in our community. So I'd love for you to answer it. Yeah, I think I mean, I think first you do need to design and think about what, what where am I going? What 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 is this portfolio that I want to get into? What does that look like? That's the first stage. You don't want to start going down a path and not know where where the end is or where the where the goal is. Um, after you determine that, then you look at what you already have, and a lot of it is going to be the same. So then you are looking at, well, what needs to be transitioned? And how long do we how long of a glide path do we really need or want? And how long that is, it's there's no one size fits all here. Uh, but I can give you some very a basic, thumb would be this. When you are about five years out from when you think you're going to, um, that is the time to think about moving it. And if your portfolio is near an all-time high, then you could move it all at once then and kind of be done with it. You know, I've only recently retired, but we moved our portfolios into retirement style portfolios several years ago. Um, simply because it, 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 what you don't, what you're trying to uh, think about, what you're trying to avoid, invert the question, like Charlie Munger says, what what you don't want to happen is you're riding that you know 100 percent or high equity portfolio, and you have a stock market crash two years before you're supposed to retire. So as long as you can avoid that, you can do a variety of things. You can transition over as many as. 10, 15 years, if you really wanted to, you could take a little part of this portfolio and test drive it for a while. The sort of the simplest way to do this is, well, I'm, I'm, I'm getting close and I have enough. Um, let me do my transition. And in fact, the other rule of thumb would be sort of as soon as you get to your fine number, anytime then is fine. Because then you're basically saying, okay, I'm going to convert this to a portfolio which allows me to just stop making any other income any day now, uh, walk away from whatever, ready to ride this. Because one thing you should understand is that these portfolios do not stop gaining money. What they typically do, just for comparison purposes, what's called the real compounded annual growth rate of the stock market since 1970 is 8%, and that is after inflation. If you transition into one of these portfolios I'm talking about, you're basically going to be giving up one to two percent of the return. So it's going to be probably between six and eight percent return after inflation. But you're what you're what you're getting in exchange for that is essentially half the volatility. So when the stock market goes down 40%, your portfolio is only going to, going to go down 20%. And that that is the trade-off, the risk reward. So as long as you are fine with not beating the stock market anymore and you've got enough for you, you can transition to your retirement or risk parity style portfolio whenever you're there. You made a great point there that I think people really should appreciate about being in the financial independence community, when you're in the financial independence community, when you have mapped out your path to FI and have a good 
understanding of what your number is, you know, when you have enough for you, like that is something that outside of this community, people just generally don't have a handle on. In fact, it's out of scarcity. I need just kind of like a, a Susie Orman number that we just throw on, make a number up, throw it at the board. It's not based on any sort of logic or reason, mostly on fear, but with what you're describing, Frank, like we've mapped out our number. We're pretty confident of what we're going to need. And then if we hit that number, you know, before our planned exit date or, or whatever, that might be an appropriate time to start looking at, wouldn't it be cool if I know, like I could lock in, you know, a, a portfolio that will give me an estimated safe withdrawal rate. And then, yeah, your portfolio is going to keep going, but you know, you have enough for you and and likely by the time you need it, it'll be and then some. Yeah, if you're if you're not withdrawing from it, obviously it's just going to sit there and keep growing. Yeah. Um. So you're 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 just going to have yeah. more. Uh. I. I. The other I guess point that I think makes sense to raise here is that when you get there, the still always on the performance of markets in the future. The most control you actually have is on the expense side of things. And so knowing what your expenses are and being able to modify those or take less in one year and more in another year, honestly, that is the the better way to think about managing your retirement rather than trying to optimize something that can't be optimized, which is the performance of your portfolio in the future. And it's well said, but in episode 172 of our podcast, uh, we did actually have Michael Kitsis on to help us with uh, flexible uh, spending rules for early retirees. So for those of you that are hearing that, that want to do a deep dive on that topic, or at least begin to approach it, highly recommend you check out that episode. You can just go to choosefi.com slash 176. Frank, quick, quick follow up. So you said something to the effect of, you know, we were talking about like how to actually move this over. Uh, you said something to the effect of, uh, it, okay, if we're at an all-time high, you can just you can just do it. Yeah, you know? if you want to. <laughs> okay. yeah, but most people aren't going to be that comfortable. But Wait, no, no, and that's what. <laughs> so help me out with that. So just just this one little piece of it, which is amounts in your your retirement buckets, you know, your four hundred one ks, your IRAs, et cetera, and then in your taxable accounts. So, yeah. right, because the taxable accounts, that's what people are worried about. Like, what the heck do I do when I have hundreds of thousands of dollars of potential, you know, cap gains in there? Are you moving a lot of this stuff in your retirement buckets or talk me through like how you Yeah, would okay, that. you're talking about the tax location issues. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, because you should treat all of your invested assets as kind of one big yeah. portfolio. Agreed. Agreed. And so, uh, yeah, the, you, do, you don't want to incur unnecessary capital gains in your taxable account. Uh, and hopefully you have, you know, lots of stocks in there that aren't um, generating a lot of taxes anyway, and they're paying qualified dividends, which are at the long-term capital gains rate. But yeah, a lot of this can be done in your retirement accounts. And, and a lot of it is appropriate to be done there because particularly if you're moving to something like REITs, which are paying a high income, but are at a, are, are taxed or at ordinary gains, you would want to put that in one of your um, traditional retirement accounts or somewhere like that. I think the, the other, um, and I did, I actually went over this with a, with the, somebody in on my, on my podcast recently, the, the, that this, this does become an issue as to all figure out, well, where is that money coming from that I'm spending first and, and second? And am I doing some kind of a, a ladder because I'm an early retiree or am I in my 50s? I'm going to, I'm going to apply, say, the rule of 55 if you got that K and you left then. Or are you just going to use that taxable brokerage account and ride that until you get to 59 and a half, which is another you know option in your 50s? A lot of it depends also on things like do you have a pension? Is there some other form of income? Are you going part time? Do you have a spouse that's working? Um, all, all of those things play into these issues as to how you you move these things around but ideally you have the least movement possible um, and that you locate the things that are paying ordinary income put them in your retirement accounts because they're going to get taxed at that rate anyway when they come out 
That's perfect. So we're going to go ahead and pivot here in just a second to kind of community questions. And we're going to start picking uh, from, from those of you that leave your comments. So please keep them coming. I've got some of you have already ready to go teed up and then uh, please just keep submitting them and we'll kind of dedicate this to your questions. Frank, uh, tonight we're, we're, we're speaking with Frank Vasquez, host of the Risk Parity Radio podcast. And uh, I guess just little definitions of terms here. We've said it, but I don't know if we've defined it risk parity. We've also said risk parity portfolio. What does that mean in an elevator pitch or speech for someone that's hearing this for the first time? Risk parity. This is a a style of of investing or a style of a portfolio that has been around since the 1990s. It was pioneered by Ray Dalio and then all kinds of different people jumped on it and have written all kinds of articles about it in the past 20 years or so. And it's really been something that that hedge funds have been doing for a long time. But we now have the opportunity to do that as do-it-yourself investors because we have all these ETFs that, that are specifically designed for different assets and we have no fee trading and we have more options than you did 20 years ago. But the main print on a risk parity style portfolio is finding assets that are uncorrelated or negatively correlated and combining them in, in such a way to reduce the overall risk of the portfolio. So you said finding assets. What are the basket or bundle that we're just generally looking at, like as we're picking what to put in our basket? Are there common themes that we see? So stock index funds, maybe stocks, bonds, different types of bonds. Like what what's the a la carte menu here? Yeah, usually you have um, a, a th- that your main driver of returns is still going to be stocks. And you're, you, you may have between 40 and 60% in that. As the most diverse thing from that, you're usually looking at treasury bonds and often long-term treasury bonds. And you only need maybe 20% in something like that. You don't need 40% in those kind of bonds. They're, they're volatile and, and they're very diverse, uh, but a little goes a long way. Then you look at some alternatives. Um, gold is a useful alternative if, if used in moderation. And a good article to look at for that is go to Big Earn Safe Withdrawal Rate Series number 34, where he did an 80-year analysis of putting gold in the portfolio. He was trying to prove that it wouldn't help. And he actually proved that it helps. <laughs> so you can use an ETF for that. I don't I don't buy physical gold. I don't hide it in my backyard. Um, (laughs) But somewhere between 5 and 15% of in that is is kind of useful. The the last time I heard Bill Bengen, the author of the 4% rule interviewed, his portfolio is something like 25% stocks, 5% gold, and the rest in fixed income. (laughs) He's an older guy with a very conservative portfolio, but, but it's interesting how people have used these things. Then you can look at some other alternatives to put in in these portfolios. One of the one of the problems we have with bonds these days is that they're not good income generators anymore. They're just not. The uses they really perform are stability if they're short term bonds, or diversity if they're long term treasury bonds or intermediate term treasury bonds. So everybody's looking for income sources. The kind of go to two places to go for that are REITs, which have a decent um, performance. Um, and it's interesting for those, you can use the, the REIT funds, but they're, they, they're kind of odd looking these days if you look inside of them because they're not, they're not real estate. They're things like data centers and cell towers and um, not traditional real estate. You can also just buy big REITs that are just nice real estate um, REITs like one like Realty Inc., it's ticker symbol O. It owns 6,000 leases on things like Walgreens. Uh, so it's very reliable. The other, the other thing besides REITs to often look at for income is preferred shares. And you can buy a fund. And the, the common one I use is called PFF. And this, again, if you ask Rick Ferry, what do you invest in? What do you do for income? He does two things. He does PFF and he does municipal bonds because he's in a high tax bracket. Um, I wouldn't recommend municipal bonds unless you're in a high tax bracket with a, a taxable account. But those are some some ideas. 
and, and then you can you, you can look at putting other things in your portfolio. If you want to put that Bitcoin in there, you can look at putting it in there. But make sure that it has a, what's called a volatility match to it. If you have something that's that volatile, and what I mean by that volatile, it's 10 times vo- more volatile than the stock market. You, you just can't put too much in there. It's like 1% or 2%. It, it, otherwise, it just dominates the performance of the portfolio. But it is possible to construct different portfolios where you have the key factors being the uh, stock funds and the the treasury bond funds, and then looking at uh, a, a sort of a basket of, of alternatives. Six sample portfolios on my website that I update. They're live. <laughs> they they uh, and and we update them every week, and they're on Fidelity, and you can monitor them and see what's in them to get some ideas if you're interested in in pursuing these sorts of things. Now, one thing I didn't talk about was the different kinds of stocks um, that you can put in. Well, that's great because I was actually going to tee you up for this question from Andy. And and he says, you know, thanks for the live event. Frank, what percentage of stock portfolio would you recommend investing in international stocks? And I just want to kind of reframe that just a little bit in terms of like if we're looking at this through the lens of diversification, like th- it's probably important to, to figure out what is the goal here, right? So in terms of like, if we're saying, all right, we have this stock, you know, let's say we have a, a total stock market index fund, but you know, should we get a world fund or should we tilt towards international? It's a slightly different conversation than what we're discussing, which is a different form of diversification. Really, we're looking at correlation. Yeah, and that's and that is actually the way I look at that these things at all of these things. So uh, let's take let's take inter- international funds. The the issues we have with international funds these days is they're a lot of them are highly correlated with US funds. So you're not you're not getting your grandfather's diversification anymore. <laughs> Back in the 80s and 90s if you bought like a a, a fund of European stocks it was only like 20 or 30% correlated with U.S. stocks now it's now it's uh, often these funds are over ninety percent correlated, hmm. and so that if you have something that's that correlated with what you already have, it's it doesn't it's not very useful to you. Interesting that you ought you ought to just pick one or the other. What accounts for that? Is it just the growing size of uh, corporations? Like it's just kind of a consolidation of. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I ask myself this question all the time because the um, I think one of the problems uh, with a lot of international stock funds is that the stock markets in a lot of other countries don't actually reflect the the economy of the of the country. What often reflect specialized stocks that people like to put in those countries. So if you buy Canadian stocks and get all these mining stocks and oil stocks, you don't get the the Canadian economy. Uh, That's a guess. The other kind of stock you often see, particularly on the European side, are essentially large banks, large cap value kind of stocks that are similar to large cap value stocks in 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 the United States as well. So I've, I, this is something I've actually been trying to wrestle with and trying to look for funds that actually reflect what is going on in other economies. Um, and I don't have a clear or good answer to this. One, one of the, 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 the newer things that is possible to invest in now is called China A shares. And those are um, uh, Chinese companies that are listed on Chinese exchanges and pretty much only there, those tend to be highly, uh, much less correlated with um, with U.S. stocks mm-hmm. and, and most other uh, international stock funds. So, I mean, the short answer to that, that question, I, I would say is somewhere between zero and 20 <laughs> percent. I don't I don't think you need them, at, at least at this stage, if you're looking at the sort of typical big international funds they're not doing what they're kind of advertised to do these days. If you want to know whether something's correlated again, I would go to the asset correlation tab or link at portfolio visualizer, and you can take whatever fund you are 
thinking of investing in and line it up with your U.S. stock funds and then look at those correlations. And that's that's often what uh, that's often what I do is 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 if somebody suggests something, one of the first things I do is I go put it in there and say, well, is this different from the things I'm already investing in? Because if it's not really different, then it either has to uh, take the place of something, you exchange it. I'm not going to invest in that anymore. I got this one. Uh, or, or it's just not that useful. And, and so that, I, I, I think of this, these in, in terms of a process of deciding whether something is useful in my portfolio or not. Do I already have something in there that does that um, as, as sort of the, the process? And so looking at that correlation and then looking at the, the correlation with what I have, the performance overall of what this thing is, and then what is its volatility? Is it nice and low and doesn't move around much or, or is it have a high volatility? And that tells you oftentimes how much of that you would want to put in your portfolio because if it's, you know, if it's like Tabasco, you don't want to <laughs> fill your portfolio with it or it'll, it'll you'll burn yourself. <laughs> so Frank, I think that ties into Luke's question here, which is have your views changed on factor investing? And do you have or plan to add small cap value to your portfolio? So I guess that's uh, something Paul Merriman has talked about. And I guess, you know, this ties in also like there, it, there's this narrative that we're weaving, right? Of Like, as you said, it's performance, it's the correlation. And, you know, how does all this, is it worth it to put this in? Right. Like, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on Luke's question. Yeah, this is a great example. Um, and I do have small cap value funds in my portfolio because oddly enough, they are less correlated with the overall stock market than an international fund. Mm. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so what you can look at the, 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 uh, there are a couple of different ones. The, the, the one that seems to be the least correlated is based on the S&P 600 small cap value index. And so an ETF like VIOV, which is a Vanguard ETF, and there are several other ones that follow that same index. Um, but but if, if you took that and, and you put it in that correlation analysis, it, it comes out at 0.77. And that's a low correlation for two stock funds. If you put in one of those international funds, it's gonna it's gonna be over over 0.8 and up to and maybe even over 0.9, uh, which means they're they're just totally correlated. So I having a, a a good if you wanted a basic two fund portfolio in in uh, that was your stock portion. If you put a large cap growth fund and a small cap value fund those are good um, as just a very basic, uh, okay, I want to cover the whole market and I want some uh, diversification here. The where, where you see this performance is interesting in that uh, are the large cap and people are seeing this now because there's more reflation or inflation in the economy recently. And so Small cap value stocks have been dogs for ten years. That's a very long time to be a dog when you're a believer yeah, in small then, cap value. And then value. all of a sudden, all of a sudden in the past six months, they're up like seventy yeah. percent. Um, so, so, uh, so they've gone a little crazy. And it's historically, also, you'll see that, for instance. People look back to the 1970s as a really bad time for stocks, and the stocks did not perform well for most of that decade. But small cap value stocks actually, after the recession in 1973, 74, for the next 12 years, they went up every single year. And you, and you couldn't say that of, of most of the stock market. And so it, it is a diverse sector of the market. Hmm. The other thing that um, plays into this is the fact that a total market fund like VTSAX or VTI is heavily weighted towards large cap growth just by its nature because it is cap weighted. It has more of the largest stocks in it. And so when the largest stocks are growing the most, it ends up having lots and lots of those. So uh, a, a total stock market fund is actually 
mostly large cap growth and some large cap value. So is um, the correlation between a total stock market index and an S&P 500, is that like 0. 0.98, 0. 0.99? 0.99. It is. <laughs> Yeah, just pick one. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you don't you, you don't need both, and that and that is a, an example of of um, uh, of a kind of a false diversification. These things have different names, so they must be different. And then, no, they're really not. There's also a great amount of overlap, and that's one of the one of the things I think amateur investors get caught up in. They they. They pick stocks or funds like they're going to the supermarket and said, oh, I'll just get a little bit of this and a little bit of this and a little bit of this. But they didn't, didn't have a recipe. And so they they end up with a whole bunch of, of things that are, you know, they're, they're all different cuts of meat. <laughs> and, and, and you don't have any vegetables. And, and so the other thing that you really want to be cognizant of, of is not only did you analyze the correlation between these two things, but do they actually have the same things in them? Because a lot of these funds have overlapping. Let me, uh, let me get your take on that. Just to kind of not, not pin you down per se, but just to, uh, be, since we've addressed both of them, we've talked about all the ingredients. Uh, let's come back to free your finances uh, question. What are your thoughts of the fact that index funds are cap weighted? We just talked about that. So as a company becomes more overvalued, uh, it's market cap may well increase uh, two, leading it to be overweighted in the index. So all of this is literally what we what we just said. You uh, you know, overvalued maybe or maybe not, but but certainly uh, things are tilted towards you know these very large growth companies. And it sounds like we were just discussing that you know small cap value has a little bit less correlation. And so now with you know those ingredients in mind, um, just kind of set you up for this kind of uh, this comparison here. We have just a very simple approach, which is buy a total stock market index fund. Uh, yes, it's cap weighted, but to JL Collins' point, it's also self-selecting, which works for you. So it, you know, if, if a company becomes less valuable, then you're also progressively owning less of it. It's a self-cleansing mechanism. And then on the other side of that, we have, instead of being cap weighted, let's have equal amounts of various asset classes. It's kind of the Paul Merriman approach. And let's have some small cap, it's a small cap value. Let's have some large cap. Let's kind of like try to hit these different asset classes in, in the stocks, I guess, in this, in this case, let's try to hit them a little bit more evenly. Where do you land on that? Where's in your mind for you personally, or just kind of as you're looking at it through risk parity, where is that line of delineation between complexity and just the simplicity know, principle? Yeah, yeah the simplicity <laughs> that, that, principle. That's, that's, uh, that's, that comes from Rick Ferry. Um, and, and basically he's his criticism and Paul and uh, Jack Bogle's criticism of Paul Merriman's 10 funds portfolio is that it's just too complicated for most people to manage, which is why. Paul Merriman has gone and, and given easier alternatives to his portfolios. But getting to your question, yeah, th th think about these funds. They, they are self-cleansing in different ways. And that's what's interesting about index funds is that they're not static. A fund like VTSAX, which is cap-weighted, is getting more and more of the larger companies all the time. So as as companies do better, the fund acquires more of it. It's basically a momentum following fund. And then as companies in there are doing worse, they fall hmm. down in the rankings or, or, or fall for fall out of the rankings if it's an S&P 500 fund. Think about a, a small cap value fund is is doing the reverse. When it gets too big, it gets kicked out <laughs> when when it when it gets when it gets too growthy it'll get kicked out of, of the fund mm. because they that's also based on an index that is changing over time so each fund it has a little bit different rules to it but i think the idea that that i come back to is is let's let's get the let's get the ones that are on the basically on the different ends of the spectrum, which are that large cap value one and the small cap, I'm sorry, the large cap growth fund and the small cap value fund. Then if you want to add some other things in the middle, you can try them out and see what they look like um, if you analyze their correlations. I, I think the problem is after a while, it just ends up, like I said, they end up being too similar in performance overall and they don't, 
they just add complexity without adding anything uh, in particular in terms of not making your portfolio any less volatile and not making your portfolio perform any better. So after just a few of few of these funds, you 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 find that you end up with um, just more of a random performance. There is, and there's an important principle that I think most people have a very difficult time comprehending, and it's called the macro allocation principle. And to learn about this, you need to go to the book of Jack. The book of Jack is Common Sense Investing by Jack Bogle. And and uh, uh, the chapter and verse from chapters 18 and 19, where he discusses this and what he says in there and what has been proven over time is that what matters the most in constructing a portfolio is those macro allocations. Is it 50, 50 stock bonds, 60, 40, 80, 20? And then you can expand that out to uh, if you have other alternatives, you know, is it 50, 30, 20 is it? <laughs> uh, for depending on how many different total asset classes you have. But what he's saying is that it, any 60, 40 portfolio is likely to perform over 94 percent the same as any other 60, 40 portfolio, mm. um, which is it, it, it to understand because. What it's telling you is that by spending all your time fiddling with the stock funds is not really going to change your, your likely performance that much. It's getting those macro allocations down between the very different asset classes that is really going to drive what your portfolio is. So think about a 100% equity portfolio. Basically what this is saying is, if you if you grab a bunch of reasonably diversified um, uh, stock funds and compare that to just VTSAX, the odds of them be having the similar performances over the next ten years are it's higher than ninety percent. Wow. And the difference here, and this is what people don't like to hear, is is most likely to be random. <laughs> <laughs> and that 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 is, what it means is is we are we are kind of stuck with uh, having if you if you try to over optimize based on the past in particular and the recent past you're likely to have something that actually doesn't perform as well as something that is just kind of basic and covers the bases as far as that portion of your stock portfolio that's in stocks. And caveat this is I'm not talking about stock picking. If you're a great stock picker, yes, you will outperform the market, but I, I'm really focused on- if you're on, a bad um, stock picker, you will underperform the market. Uh, yeah, I, I'm th- th- I'm talking about somebody who's putting together portfolios of, of diversified funds. And that's, that's what Jack Bogle was talking about. All right, this is Claudia's question. And Frank, uh, going back to bonds here, she had a question about a bond tent. So I would probably need a definition of terms here. And it seems like she's questioning it, what it would do for sequence of return risk. Why would you be interested in one? Okay, yeah, uh, a a bond tent is a, is a, a an old fashioned way of dealing with sequence of return risk before you had a lot of different bond funds and what you would what you would traditionally do to create a bond tent and this is going back to the 1980s is you would actually go out and buy bond issuances frequently you would do this with treasury bonds which you can buy straight from the government and so you would line up a a um a portion of one year bonds two year bonds three year bonds four five six and that's typically what it, you would do the short terms for for a, a, a bond tent for that. And you can do that and it will help you, but it's not going to be functionally different than buying, say, a short-term bond fund and an intermediate bond fund that are already tinted for you. Because if you look inside the specialized bond funds and they are now, you can get short, intermediate, and long-term in treasuries, in corporates, in there are probably, I, I did a couple of bond episodes for my podcast and, and basically broke them out into, I think, 20 different kinds of bond funds that are available now. And so the it, it's, it's the same idea that the 
the shorter term bonds are going to be the most stable. And then the idea of a bond tent is when the when the one year rolled off, you would put it back up on top uh, at the at the eight to ten year. Um, it still would work fine. Um, I just don't think you necessarily need to do that anymore. That you can construct the same kind of thing using the appropriate bond funds. So that sounds similar to what you said about Ray Dalio and his his portfolio in the '90s, right? Like we as normal people might not have had access to this. So we would have had to have resorted, I guess, in this case, to this bond tent. But you're saying they're just there are funds that do that for you. So it sounds yeah, a lot yeah, the, yeah. The, that that stuff didn't exist back then. Um, yeah. you, it existed in terms of bond funds were mostly managed mutual funds, which yeah. were and they still exist, but they're expensive. You didn't have the ETF universe that you have now which has really only existed for about the past 20 years, I would say. Really, they started coming more online in 2003 and 2004, and then you had more, more options then. But if you go back into you know what I call the Bronze Age of financial advice back in the 80s and 90s, they, you know, financial advisors were constructing portfolios out of individual stocks, individual bonds, and a few um, funds that were expensive. And it's amazing how grossly expensive things were in the past. You used to have to pay an 8% load on a mutual fund back in the 1960s. You hear that, people? You're living in the golden era of investing. (laughs) Do you appreciate how easy you have it? We are really living in, yeah. I, 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 I call this going into the, the age of steel, that the, the Bronze Age was, the, the, was from the 70s and the 80s when, uh, you know, folks were putting together the first 60, 40 portfolios, but they were doing it out of, you know, whole cloth. Uh, and then you get to the Iron Age, which is basically the age of, of index funds coming online and Jack Bogle getting things together. And and now I feel like we are going to the age of steel where we have no fee trading and fractional shares and ETFs and virtually anything you want to buy. So if you really want to buy coffee or cotton, you can buy an ETF that does that, (laughs) which is unbelievable to me at this point. It's all out there. It's it's all there for you. It's, it's, uh, that 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 may be why it's kind of getting kind of overwhelming. But well, you know, hopefully we, just we can just options. focus a little bit more on you know what the eighty twenty is inside of that. The, those really huge selections, Frank. I wanted to go back to this point that you made earlier, and it was just kind of that you know bonds have kind of been unattractive of late. And I think it kind of goes a little bit here to what uh, Igor's saying. He says bonds should be opposite of the market, but lately bonds have moved with the market. So what, what's, you know, what space does that leave for us to use bonds? And I wanted to kind of tie a couple other things for you to touch on here. I know there's been some movement in the long-term uh, treasury yields, uh, interest, uh, the 10 year interest rate. There's just a few things going on in the background. I'd love for you to kind of talk through, you know, what is working well in the bond community, where do they work well? And maybe kind of why some people have soured on it to some degree of late. Yeah, I think, I think, well, the first problem is different bonds behave differently. Um, and again, this goes back to correlations that, and that one of the problems we have with total bond funds is, first of all, they aren't total, they don't cover the total bond universe. They cover whatever the purveyor of that thought should go in a total bond fund. The second problem you have is bonds are are positively correlated with stocks and they always have been in particular if you go out to junk bonds or what's called high yield those are 70 percent correlated with the stock market so you're not getting any diversification out of something like that at all and you're not getting much diversification out of uh other corporate bonds even uh, even the high quality ones so what that leaves you with is really focusing on treasury bonds for diversification. And uh, um, this is why, for instance, if you ask Paul Merriman what's in his portfolio, all of his bonds are treasury bonds. They're all treasury bonds because they are the most diversified from the stock part of it. And so when you are thinking, I, I, have, I don't use corporate bonds at all 
I might use them if they paid a higher yield than they do, but I can't see the risk reward right now. But if you look at the treasury bonds, just the treasury, um, they have been uncorrelated with the stock market. And you can go back to last year. This really comes out front and center when you have a stock market crash. So when the stock market went down last March of 2020, 40%, uh, the long-term treasury bonds were up 25 to 30%. And so you could see that that, that is why most risk parity style portfolios in that in that time period were down a maximum of 20% if they were well constructed. And, and then you get a rebalancing opportunity because you sell the bonds when they're high and then buy the stocks when they're low and, and everything's glorious. It's true, though, that in the past three months, we've seen in bonds a, a very bad performance, particularly in long term treasury bonds that. It's it's been the worst performance in three months since 1980 for that the, those funds, and then this is why you want to be well diversified because what was doing well and what typically does well when those bonds are doing poorly are small cap value funds. Mm. So, so this the small cap value is up, you know, 30, 40 percent at the same time. The the, the long term treasuries are down 14 percent. And that's what happens in these kinds of portfolios. I, I think that it, it, what is jarring about that is people really want to have all of their stuff going up at once. But if you really want to get a diversified portfolio and the hallmark of a, a very diversified portfolio is you will see things moving in different directions at different times. Um, and it does take a little bit of just getting used to. And it, 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 it's hard for whatever reason for people to wrap their heads around that, but that's, you know, that's, that's fine. We're all, we're all learning and figure, figuring yeah. this out. And, and Frank, that's what I wanted to follow up with. So, uh, you know, a lot of people, many people in our community are heavily concentrated in low cost index funds. And then maybe like somebody like me, like, oh, I'll diversify, right. I'll, uh, I'll get some real estate. So I have some single family rentals patting myself on the back. I'm diversified, but I have no idea how correlated they are. Right. And like, that's my question to you is like, I think a lot of people think, okay, I'm doing well. I've got, I've got these two, these two different asset classes, but some black swan event hits to the economy. Are they uncorrelated? No. I mean, if people are losing their jobs, are they, you know, like, so <laughs> there's, I, there's that, that existential problem. Right. That, like that, I'm not, that, I'm not patting that, myself in the back anymore then. So talk me through real well, estate and gone. stocks, I guess. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're completely. Well, I, I, I mean, I, I think in most times that real estate and rentals yeah. I'm talking about, not, not REITs, but rentals and, and stocks are, are, have a low correlation. Or a, they do have a low card. Yeah, they 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 just do because okay. uh, you're running a little business. So I can pat myself on the back. Yes, you should. <laughs> yes, you should. That's a very that's a very good way of, of diversifying. Um, yes. Is, yes. To, is to own some <laughs> some rental real estate. Um, it, it, but it, but it's a little business, and you need to sure have right completely separate argument. Yeah, manage right. it and. And it's subject to its own idiosyncratic um, where it is, you know, what the what the rentals are, are like in that area. And, and you know, it's a, that's a whole separate topic that I'm, I'm not an expert in. I have I have one rental. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, that's 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 a very um, useful thing to have uh, as a, as an uncorrelated asset. But you are right in in that that existential crisis 2008 it, it is possible for these things to go down together i think on the real estate side the real question is not taking too much leverage you know that's borrowing too much money that's how people got into trouble back in 2007 and 8 is they they had you know borrowed lots and lots and had a bunch of rentals that they couldn't um support the the mortgages for if they um if they didn't have a renter in them that's uh, you don't want to be in that that kind of position but that 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 has more to do with taking too much leverage than 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 a correlation issue i think i I think that that um a separate business is a nice thing to have and that's actually why i like um a lot of the individual reits is because 
I look at them like businesses and the specialty ones are, are very interesting. I mean, you can buy a warehouse or a WY, which uh, what it does is it grows wood. <laughs> It, it grows managed timber and sells timber it to Home Depot. It's doing very and, well right now, is my and understanding. It's a, it's a business, and it, it went up 116 percent since last since, since last March. For you know, it's it's just a simple business. There's another one. There's another one ticker symbol. It's called it's Lamar Advertising, L A M R, and it is in the billboard business. 80 miles of south of the border. I'm pretty sure the Lamar. So, so it rents it rents billboards. <laughs> <laughs> I've driven up and down I-95 recently. What is going <laughs> on there? <laughs> um, um, and, and, and so the, the, I, I like those things because they're, the, they are like separate businesses with yeah. their own, their own thing going on. Um, it, it, to me, those are more like having, you know, a, a, you know, a real estate business or any kind of um, thing on, on the side that, that is not going is essentially have a low correlation with the, with the stock market. Let me, uh, let me kind of create this framework for people and for myself just to kind of see where you land on this, but I want to really think about these terms, diversification versus correlation and see, are they the same? Is one being misused? Can you be very well diversified, but have really bad correlation? Like you want, you know, you, you, you do not want it to be correlated, but Oh, my friend, you are. Yeah. To, to me, to me, I think, uh, that, uh, diversification should mean uncorrelated. In my in my perfect world, where people use terms the way I'd like to use them, I would say that diversification should mean uncorrelated. And so, I guess for people listening, I agree with you. I tend to agree with you, and I realize that is not the way that most people think about diversification. They just think about a lots of random different things. And until maybe an episode like this, you know, they don't really have a quantitative measurement. It's all qualitative. Diversification as a term feels very qualitative. I think that I'm all over the place. I've got lots of different stuff. I've got, I've got lots of stuff. I'm diversified. And you don't know until you actually go run a few numbers and then you can see, I mean, the, the, uh, the sort of the emergent property of a diversified portfolio is low volatility or lower volatility than you would expect. Um, and then it plays into these risk reward measures. Um, and I don't know how far you want to go into that. There's something called the sharp ratio. There's something called the Sortino ratio. And those are racial measure the, the risk versus reward of a portfolio. Um, and the higher, you, the higher you have there, the, the better risk reward ratio you have, but what plays into that are, are diversification and, how stable or unstable the uh, components are. Well, Frank, we barely scratched the surface of the questions that are continuing to come in. Would you be interested in joining us for like a monthly chat and we'll just come on Facebook and take people's questions and continue yeah, to do fun. this? It's just, it, it's a lot of I'm fun. I'm retired. <laughs> you are, congratulations. <laughs> we should talk through that. What you're doing on the side, <laughs> and I and I do answer some particular to to my podcast for for people that that send them into that. Well, let's start there. So go ahead and tell people about your podcast and where they can find it. I'm sure there's a lot of people that that are going to want to pick up this conversation over there. Yeah, it's called Risk Parity Radio, and you can find it if you search Risk Parity or Frank Vasquez in any podcast place. I, I think I'm the only one that has a name with risk parity in it and uh you there is so there, there's the podcast and what we talk about in there is these kind of time it's a very focused podcast i try to just keep it on that because there's so many other um better broader podcasts about uh other things but i do answer sort of all kinds of personal finance questions that just come up so the other thing that's interesting about it is that i have taken and created six sample portfolios over at Fidelity and update them every week. And so there's a very conservative one called the All Seasons, and there are sort of three middling ones. One is called the Golden Butterfly, one is called the Golden Ratio, one I call the Risk Parity Ultimate. And then I have two experimental portfolios that used leveraged funds, which is a kind of a new thing going on out there. I just wanted to see what would happen. So, so we talk about those every week and how they're doing and what's going on with the, the various components of those. And we talk about 
different kinds of invest in investments. And what I like to use, and this for anybody who's really interested in investing, I think one of the best books that's come out in most recent years is by J. David Stein, who has a podcast called Money for the Rest, wrote a book, um, uh, Money for the Rest of Us, 10 Questions to Master Successful Investing. Um, and he is a former institutional fund manager um, who you know knows four or five times as much about stuff as, as I do and how to invest in all kinds of things. But, but he's got these 10 questions and I use those as a process for talking through various kinds of investments and whether we might use them or how we might use them in a, uh, in a retirement portfolio. And so, and people have suggested various ones um, and we've talked about those and there's, so there's, you know, there's one about REITs and there's one about utilities and we talk about, uh, gold and we talk about um, uh, Bitcoin. And <laughs> if you go through the, I think I have about, I have over 70 podcasts now. I just started doing this last 70 podcasts? Ah, go, Frank. Yeah, I, I just started. Do, they're short. Uh, yeah, he's I, retired, I, people. He's retired. I, mean, uh, I, I, yeah. I just started doing it last July. Uh, I tried to do two a week. Um, nice. and, and but they're also, pretty short, right, Frank? They're sub 30 minutes usually? Generally, yeah, most of them. Uh, I, I've got a couple of longer ones, but now, but I think the longest one is 50 minutes. We well, got Jason who just uh, commented saying, I just subscribed to Frank's podcast. And we've got Jennifer saying once a month investing chat, count me in Julie monthly Q and a with Frank. Yes, please. So yeah, I think we've, uh, we've got some fans here. So yeah, Frank, this was an absolute blast. Thanks for taking out the time. Yeah, sure. Take, no, this your time is out. This is fun. I'm, I'm glad there are people that like to nerd out on this stuff. Yeah. And, and I, and I, I, I do, I do want to say that you, you don't have to nerd out on this to be a successful investor. Yeah. <laughs> you, you can set it and forget it if you prefer to do it that way and you'll, you'll, you'll be just fine. All right. One last time. That's risk parody radio. I can tell you that as soon as I, as soon as Brad and I heard that Frank had started a podcast or like that, is going to be popular in this space. Very specifically in this space, that is going to be a well-received podcast. And Frank is a huge wealth of knowledge for this community and very excited. We'd love to make this type of uh, show happen a little bit more often for you. I think it, it's fun. It's informal. And we love getting your questions live like this. It allows us to react to, you know, real-time scenarios that are potentially pain points in people's lives. And it's good to have these conversations. All right. Well, with that, uh, the fire is spreading, my friends. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled.